is an eight iron and it's a dead shank. Wow. Way right. Oh, Take that shank. Hop off the puzzle. You gotta be kidding me. Very tough pitch shot right here. You gotta hit it into the hill. One hop up and bite and it's in. Kind of like that. Well, I would like to welcome to the Sub-70 podcast Haskins Award winner, former All-American at the University of Stanford, and current Web.com player, Maverick McNeely. Maverick, thanks for taking the time today to be with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you've uh, played your first season uh, on the Web.com in 2018 as a professional. Looking back, what was the biggest thing you learned about being a professional and what it takes to be successful at a, at a pretty darn high level? Yeah, well, the, probably the biggest difference between college golf and professional golf is just the, the volume of golf we play. Uh, I went from playing 12-ish, four-day tournaments to playing 30 in my first 55 weeks and seven-day events, and it's just a lot of golf, and, and, and that, uh, that changes the preparation you do. It changes kind of the way you work out and prepare your body. I took a lot more rest, and... Uh, it's a travel grind for sure, but um, I really enjoy the travel a lot more than I thought I was going to and um, love seeing new parts of the country and, and really enjoyed it and learned a lot this year. But uh, definitely the amount of golf we played was an adjustment, but um, I think I'll be a lot better prepared for it in year two. Looking back at your 2018 season on making the Web.com Tour Championship, you know, pretty darn successful for the first year out there. Would you say you were overall satisfied with that? Or I know you have, you know, really high expectations for yourself. Did you think uh, it should be, you know, exceeded that? Or were you pretty darn happy with the first year being out there and sort of what you accomplished? Yeah, honestly, um, expectations for last year were kind of an interesting uh, mindset shift for me because obviously turning pro – there were incredibly high expectations both for myself and other people and everything. And you know, I, I, in, in that sense, I did not live up to those expectations in my first year. I actually played pretty well for the first half of the summer, but uh, really struggled towards the, set, the second half. And, but in a lot of ways, now that I'm through that, I've, I've learned a lot more from that. And um, you know, there, there's earning years and learning years, they say, and last year was definitely a learning year. But as far as expectations go, I'm starting to realize that you know, expectations are what people think you should do. And um, I, I realize now that I can really only control what I can control, which is my preparation, which is my work ethic and discipline and just attitude and, and mindset. And um, I, in a lot of ways, that's really liberating that I don't have to worry about living up to what someone else or even what my th- my myself thinks that I should be doing and should be accomplishing and um, I'm really excited for next year when you sort of look at your golf game overall when you you know when you came out of the amateur ranks and then turned professional is there one or two parts of your game that is better say a year later that had to improve where essentially you could get away with it maybe even at high level college golf but at the professional level the guys the competition is just too good that you knew you had to tighten up yeah, well, the the competition is really good. And in a college event, it seems like there are 10 to 15 guys in a given week that can win. In a professional event, there's 150. And um, and that just means that, you know, 10 guys are going to go off, which means you have to play you really, really good to get in that top 10. And and just the, the standard expected to reach all those milestones and to finish top 10, top 5, and win is so much higher. But um, a, a big difference between every level of golf I've played and I've seen everything from junior golf to major championships is that every, the margins become a lot more fine. And you know, for one hitting fairways in college, you can hit it just about anywhere. And the, the softness of the greens, hole locations and rough make it possible for you to fire at flags um, and, and not be penalized that severely. On the web, you have to make a million birdies, but it's a lot harder to make birdies from the rough because you use a little bit of control than, than the fairway. And on the PGA Tour, missing fairways, it's it's a good par. It'll, it'll test your short game. And little things like um, short game shots are a lot more difficult. The lies are tighter. The pins are a step or two closer to the edges. And one of the things the officials love to do in these PGA Tour and web events, especially in majors, is put pins on changing slopes um, my caddy and I have gotten pretty good at guessing where hole locations are going to be because I love to put them on little crowns. So if you miss right, 
the putt breaks right, and if you miss left, the putt breaks left. Or, you know, grain changes. They love to put them around grain changes. So you just have to be that much more precise and specific. And I think I had more double-breaking putts in my first month as a pro than I did in all of college. But uh, it's just something that you, you learn to, to pick up on. The short game tightens up, and uh, there's a, a bigger premium on hitting greens. Uh, looking at equipment for 2019, I know uh, you're a Callaway staff player. Um, sure, they probably have some great stuff out for next year. Did you make any changes? What improvements have you seen? And when did you sort of start that process to get your bag set for next year? Yeah, so the, the equipment's kind of an ongoing process starting, it's crazy to think just a year and a half ago, I had no Callaway clubs in the bag because I was playing all Nike from college. Um, and I'm, I'm in love with everything in my golf bag right now. Um, probably the newest change I've made was a golf ball. And actually just yesterday, the, uh, the new driver, I don't know if we're allowed to say what the name of that driver is. I think everyone knows what it is, but, um, yeah, so I was, um, I, I switched the golf ball about three weeks ago. I basically begged the Callaway guys when they came to Vegas to do some testing with me and Aaron Wise and, Sangmoon Bay and a couple other um, Callaway guys out here. And I picked up three miles an hour of ball speed with the new golf ball and another two miles an hour with the driver head. And they didn't have enough driver heads to give me one, but I, I basically begged them to send me home with uh, the new golf ball because it was that much better. And then um, last week I cracked my driver that I've been using for nine months. So uh, that was a great excuse for them to send me the new driver, but uh, it was 48 degrees yesterday in, in Vegas and, I was getting 178 ball speed, which is pretty good for a, a little guy like me. So <laughs> that's yeah, that probably the newest. Uh, yeah, that's that's the newest update in my golf bag. And um, but you know those, those guys have been so professional, and uh, honestly, I'm starting to see the rewards of why I chose Callaway when I turned pro is because I saw their R and D process. I saw what was coming down the pipeline, and I have so much confidence. I had so much confidence that they were going to be making the best stuff, and um, I'm really lucky to be <clears throat> playing that now. Uh, when you first started playing golf, I know you played a lot of hockey growing up, which the movement is very similar to golf. So there's a lot of good hockey players, good golfers and vice versa. Uh, playing all those sports, at what age did you sort of have to focus on golf and make that sort of your number one priority versus the other sports to, to sort of get to the level that you're at at this point? So yeah, it's interesting you ask that. I think multi-sport athletes have such a higher potential to improve when they when they focus on later um so when i was young i played ice hockey golf soccer basketball tennis i swam and in high school i narrowed it down just to ice hockey and golf and i played on the high school soccer team i was terrible but i enjoyed it just to play with my friends um but it was i'd say my freshman and sophomore year of high school i actually wanted to go play division three golf and hockey for an east coast team where i figured with the season that would be possible and hockey being a winter sport and golf being a late spring and fall sport. Um, that was kind of my dream. But then I was paired with coach Ray, uh, from Stanford at the stadium qualifier my freshman year. And, um, I ended up beating one of his players who ended up being my assistant coach, my sophomore and junior year, Graham Brockington in a playoff to earn a spot at the state amateur. And I think that kind of caught his attention that, um, there was a little bit of untapped potential and, uh, ability to, to get better. And, um, it was my freshman and sophomore year of college, uh, what I really started to see that improvement, but it wasn't until coach Ray said that there was a very realistic chance that I could be on the Stanford golf team that I started to focus more on golf. And I realized I didn't want to go play two years of juniors and a you know, 20 year old freshman in college, um, sort of playing ice hockey, but, uh, yeah, that's, you know, hockey has been fantastic for me. I had some actually some back and, and SI joint issues at the end of last year. And all the stuff that my physical therapists were telling me to do was basically strengthening hockey muscles, hips, legs, core. Um, and so I decided to go skate. And I've been skating for six months now, about two to three times a week when I'm home and have had no issues with my back. And I've... Uh, I picked up six miles an hour swing speed, which is really, really fast for me. Yeah, and you can see the similarities in the motion, right? It makes it makes complete sense to me that if you can hit a slap shot effectively, you can also swing a golf club effectively. Just the the, the movements, the body strength, it's it's very, very similar. So it's cool that both sports that you exactly. really love 
you know, can actually help your professional game and, you know, you're not just doing it as a hobby. There's actually some benefit to, to getting out in the ice and, you know, and, and doing some work out there as well. For sure. Stanford, what a great school, not just from, you know, athletics, but for academics. So I could see why you made that choice, but was there other colleges that were on your radar screen at that sort of high-end D1 level when you when you decided to, to play college golf, or did that one, because of meeting the coach and you grew up in that area, sort of, you know, become number one on your radar screen, per se? Yeah, I was very lucky in the college recruiting process. Stanford was always my dream school. I was born in the Stanford Hospital. Mom and dad both went there. My aunt, uncle, grandpa had a little bit of legacy. <laughs> Um, I grew up playing the Stanford golf course, won the Stanford club championship as a freshman in high school. And, uh, that was, that was just always my dream to go there. Um, I only got one other offer to play on a team, not even with uh, scholarship, just, just an offer to play at Gonzaga university. So it was Gonzaga and Stanford. And at that time I, I committed to play for Stanford verbally. And then, um, I played it really U S junior amateur my junior year of high school and that's when I started to get interest from other coach but at that point I was already um, committed to play for my dream school and uh, didn't miss a beat. So you get there your freshman year and I'm sure you'll admit to this but you were not the best player on the team your freshman year you had a couple studs in front of you Patrick Rogers Cameron Wilson and I mean you had some big boys there playing some really great golf what did you learn coming in as, you know, a freshman of competing against those guys? And, and how did they make you a better player? That's that's a great question. I I was in such a fantastic environment to improve uh, my first couple of years in school, particularly. I thought, starting my freshman year, if I qualified for two events, that would be a great year. Because I saw Patrick Rogers, Cameron Wilson, the two best players in college golf. David Boot had five top tens his freshman year. Uh, and then Jim Liu and Virat Badwar, the two highest recruits in the class basically and then me this kid that's played more hockey than golf growing up um but i uh, i loved it and i actually my senior year of high school i played on the soccer team and i was probably the worst player on the team but in a lot of ways that taught me how to get better and how to be okay asking somebody for help and how to be okay with seeking out advice and trying to get better and after my first couple of years in school, I'd always rather be the worst player on a great team than the best player on a poor team because there's an opportunity to improve. Uh, Cameron Wilson taught me off flight laws and track man. And, um, Patrick Rogers taught me preparation and professionalism and uh, a, a winning mindset and win- making winning a habit. David Boot was, has probably some of the most incredible short game hands I've ever seen. Uh, Virat Badwar. I didn't beat him in a putting contest my entire freshman year. So it was it was a pretty awesome. And then Coach Ray and Coach Rowe, uh, Phil Rowe is now assistant at uh, UNLV. It, it, I had so many great people helping me and, and wanting me to, to get better. And I took the, the attitude that everyone on the team does at least one thing better than me. And if I can learn a little bit from them on that, I'll, I'll be a better player by the end of it. Well, you must have learned something because by by the time your sophomore year starts, you're off and running. Um, The wind starts stacking up and you're sort of in the ascension, becoming the best, you know, amateur golfer in the world. Were you surprised it happened that fast where you went from a very good player to a great player? I really was, honestly. Um, I had a kind of the first surprise was uh, right after my freshman year, I qualified for the U.S. Open with my dad caddying for me. Um, and I had a stretch there from Lake Merced to the Olympic Club uh, in that qualifier in Daly City where I played five under for six under par for five holes. I just blacked out for about 45 minutes. Um, I, I lipped out a pitching wedge and a three-wood. And, uh, and then a TV camera showed up from the local news station, and that freaked me out a little bit. I said, oh, man, I think I'm... I think I must be in the number, and I promptly missed a two-footer, but uh, somehow managed to scrape it around and um, almost made the cut at Pinehurst, which was awesome. And then started my sophomore year, I remember I was so nervous before that first round playing number one for the first time for Stanford team. I I remember I was feeling, uh, I felt like I wanted to throw up on the seventh hole. I was so nervous. I was too over par, just hitting it everywhere. And the eighth hole was, it's downhill, 240-yard par three in Thousand Oaks. 
it was a front left pin, bunker long left was dead, water short, and it had been a four iron. And I was standing over the ball thinking, I don't want to hit this shot. And I actually stepped off it. I never step off shots. Uh, I stepped off it and had a quick little chat with myself and said, Maverick, what are you talking about? This is ridiculous. This is what you play for. Why are you scared? You know, somebody has to fill these, this role. Somebody has got to step up and hit the best shot of the year to about two feet, tapped it in. I think I shot 31 or 30 on the back nine and ended up winning that tournament by five. Um, and then I won the next one at Olympia fields. And then I kind of got back to Stanford and <laughs> what just happened. What was that all about? But, um, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's beautiful to play with no expectations or at least not worrying about expectations and, um, and just taking it day by day. You kind of brought up the U S open, which I was going to get to, but I, I believe you were 18 years old and you play in that. And just like, what's the coolest part about playing in a major championship at that age, at such an iconic venue at Pinehurst number two, and it's a major championship. What did you sort of take away from that of like just the coolest couple parts of it? Oh man. Well, they say you always remember that first hole, and I remember that first hole at Pinehurst. It was number 10, and uh, I was playing a set of Nike blades, and that three iron used to be my favorite club, but I remember standing on that tee, looking down at this three iron, thinking, there's no way I'm going to hit this club face. It's way too small. Um, I kind of scuzzed one out there, and then another scuzzy three iron. I had seven iron into the green. It was a front right pin, uh, Pinehurst, it falls off behind, falls off short, falls off right. And of course, I bail out about 60 feet left. I've got this up and over, straight downhill, 60 footer that I'm hoping I don't de green. Uh, one of my playing partners has already chipped three times and is about to make an eight. And uh, I've got this three foot slider left to right, straight down the hill, and I just smash it in the back of the hole. And, okay, we're fine. We're off and running. Um, and then I missed a 10 footer for Birdie on 11 and then birdied number 12. And I remember looking up on the leaderboard because I was one of the first off, and I was T5 at the U.S. Open. I said, that's pretty cool. I'm tied for fifth in the U.S. Open. But um, it was really special having my dad caddy for me, daddy caddy. And, you know, that's, that's something where that's really, really special for us. And um, I had all my brothers there, my family, my mom. And, and, you know, our family, we're a golf family. We love playing golf together and um, honestly those are the most special things for us is when we all get to be together and play and we spend more time on the golf course together than just about anywhere. You, you touched on this a little bit earlier as well and that season you had in 2015 is one for the ages in amateur golf with with the winds and you're firing on all 12 cylinders and I'm sure you've talked about you know that experience many times but my question for it is or about that is when you get on that kind of a role what did you do or how did you maintain that level for that long? I think that's the hard part. Good, great players like yourself can get on streaks, but to do it for that extended period of time, was there, did golf just seem easy? Did you have a one swing thought? Like what, what really made that work for that level of excellence for that extended period? You know, I don't really know. That's a great question. And if I knew I'd probably be doing it right now, but um, it's like I said, I think there's, I, I can take guesses and I, I write down my thoughts, my f- everything that goes on. I probably have a couple thousand pages of notes logged on all my tournaments starting my freshman year of college. And that's the question I'm trying to answer. What is it that makes me play well? And I look back on 2015, I won seven out of 12 college events that year and the NorCal match play. And that's the best golf I've played my entire life. I blacked out for a year and a half. Um, but I think that just kind of happens when you are thinking the right way, when you're preparing the right way, and it all really comes down to confidence. And how do you make your own confidence? And is that confidence coming from the right things? And so I had no expectations for myself, and I was exceeding them every week, which was really fun. Uh, I was playing for my team. I love being on a team and team sports and um, I wanted to win for our team more than anything. And uh, that was one of the more enjoyable things on final rounds. I thought, you know, I've got a two shot lead, but our team's three back. I'm going to keep the pedal down and end up winning by five. And um, I prided myself on being the first guy at the facility. And I would always want to be at least five minutes after the last guy to leave. That was just a little bit of a 
a competitive pride thing that, uh, but you know, I also remember I would have a bad day and I'd get mad and I'd go hit balls for three hours and magically I'd hit a great the next day. And I worked really hard on, um, improving my weaknesses, but also knowing that my strength and distance control with wedges and my pace control putting were, were the best things I, I did. And, um, but looking back now, I think there's less in your control than I really gave myself credit for. I think there's so much that changes on a daily basis with golf that it's impossible to have that level every single time you play. But what I'm working on now is giving my chance to play like that every time I tee it up and whatever happens happens and learn from it and uh, tweak the recipe and continue. Another Stanford alum, uh, Mr. Tiger Woods, you know, great comeback season this year. And my question is, have you gotten to know him well over the years? And if so, can you lean on him for advice and guidance? And if you do have that relationship with him, how has he helped you and, and how does that sort of work? Yeah. Tiger's a busy guy. Um, he is great. He always makes a little time for Stanford guys. And I remember him sending us text messages before the national championship to coach saying, go beat those guys, step on their throats, don't let up. Um, just you know, I really need to expect Tiger to be. Um, but probably the most I learned from him was when he came to campus my sophomore year. And this is actually right after I had won the first two events, North Ranch and Olympia Fields, and finished third at Colonial. And I just kind of gone, wow, what just happened? Tiger came to campus right after his first back surgery and spent an entire weekend with us. He was at the door of our gym at 5 a.m. waiting for them to open it, crushed a lift for two and a half hours, and then was ripping balls by 8 a.m. at our facility. And he could have easily gone to the other end, back into the range, and we would have all been too scared to bother him. But he hung out on our side, and the way it went is one of us would timidly kind of shuffle up and, and say, hey, Tiger, um, how do you hit that stinger? And just, just scared. And then he'd start answering. And eventually all 20 of us, the men's and women's team were around him in a semicircle. He was hitting shots, talking about tournaments, showing us things. He said, you know, you want to see a shot that's won the 14 majors. And we all said, yeah, of course. And he hits this six iron that launches like a nine iron. And it's just straight up in the air, comes straight down vertically on this pole. And he said, that's, that shot will hold any green on the planet. And that, that was so cool. Um, but more than anything, what I learned that week is that a lot of what I was doing, especially that sophomore year, junior year was what made Tiger so great. But what Tiger did that allowed him to beat everybody is that he just did it better. He was more focused, more disciplined. He was more intentional with everything he did. And he just knew that he was going to do everything better than you. And that's why he was going to beat you. And that to me was really inspiring to think that in a lot of ways I'm doing what made Tiger so great. And the better I want to be, the better I have to do it. What a cool experience to spend some time with him like that. It's got to be fascinating. So college career is coming to an end and, and you have to make the call if you're going to go pro or stay amateur. And I know you've talked about this 9 million times, but our listeners might not fully understand the story of uh, your dad is a founder of Sun Microsystems, built a tremendous company, and, and you had to kind of make a call. Do you go into the technology business in Silicon Valley, or you know, do you go pro? You came to the conclusion that you're, you're going to go professional, and you're going to play professional golf. What was the sort of overriding factor where you had these two great opportunities, but you said, I want to put my mark here, and you're going to go in at 100% and do it. And what, what, what sort of tilted that scale of which way you wanted to go? It's a good question. I, um, you know, my dad um, was the world's greatest devil's advocate. I walked into Coach Ray's office with him, mom, my swing coach, and my dad and said, I think I want to turn pro. And I said, I think I want to turn pro. And so then my dad laid out every reason why I shouldn't. And turn my world upside down. This was probably midway through my senior year. And you know, at this point, everyone had already made it a huge deal. He doesn't know if he's turning pro. He's going into the family business, whatever. We don't have a family business, first of all. But second of all, has anyone ever heard of a 20-year-old that doesn't know what he's going to do with his life yet? I mean, it's not that uncommon. But um, he turned my world upside down, and I went back and, and thought about everything and talked to some of my closest friends and, and thought through all the, the positives and negatives and pros and cons and everything that could 
to go on um, in, in a professional world or as a professional golfer. And um, I came back two weeks later and told the same group that uh, I, I did still want to turn pro and that's what I really wanted to do. And my dad said, that's exactly what I wanted to do. All I wanted to do was to think about it hard. And the only way you can make a bad decision is by not committing and regretting and looking back. And um, I have not done that once. And so in my, in my mind, I made a great decision. What really swayed me was the fact that I had incredible opportunities. I was very fortunate to have such great opportunities when I turned pro, um, to play in sponsors exemptions, to uh, have the support of my team at Stanford and practice facilities and uh, moving to Las Vegas and, and having everything uh, lined up here to get as good as I can. I had some fantastic opportunities partnered with great companies, Under Armour, Callaway, KPMG. Um, I've got a really exciting charitable initiative for next year, Kirky.org. It's a company, it's a nonprofit that my dad helped to start about 10, 15 years ago. And um, it's how I did my community service hours in high school. It's free open source education um, materials right now. We've got about 2.5 million uh, learning materials and an online educational community. And what we're looking to do is to create the building blocks for free education and to create your own curriculum, make it completely free and available to anybody, self-paced, on demand, and uh, and lower the cost and increase the quality of education for everyone. And so the, the PJ Tour, little known fact, the PJ Tour donates more to charity than NBA, NFL, NHL, and MLB combined every year. And it's such an amazing organization to do what they do and give back in the way they do. Every tournament is run as an independent entity and all profits from that tournament go back to um, at some sort of charitable cause. Uh, so that the PGA Tour is an incredible organization and does so much good. And that was really exciting for me. And, um, and then from the golf standpoint, my favorite thing about golf is that it teaches you so much about yourself and it's, it's like life magnified by 10. Um, everything you experience and feel and go through in golf feels so much more intense than, you know, if you miss a 10 footer, okay, there's really no big deal. But when you're playing golf, that feels like the end of the world sometimes. And learning how to deal with that and the stresses and expectations is, really made me grow a lot as a person and learn a lot about myself and has made me become better. It, I, I just realize I have to be better at a lot of the things I'm doing every day uh, and the way I think and the way I uh, act. And that's what I love most about golf. Yeah. And this, uh, the next question is, is, is and I'll kind of ask it with this angle and I was kind of thinking about this, but so you've, you've had, you know, a wonderful opportunities in your life and what you're you know, like I said what your dad and your family have accomplished it's it's fantastic and he's earned everything he's he's a self-made guy and and that story could be a podcast on itself but is is there a lot of pressure on you because you know people and I'm not saying this but people could say well if it doesn't work out professionally oh he's got x to fall back onto you know he does you know he there's really you know, his, his downside's not going to be a terrible situation. I would assume there's some real pressure on you in the sense of or internal pressure in, in, in the sense that you want to go out there and earn this. Like in golf, the, the, the golf ball doesn't care who you are, where you came from, what happens. And is there a, do you feel like there's a little bit of extra pressure, almost like the Lee Trevino scenario where he just had nothing? And there is pressure when you don't have anything, even – though you had these opportunities, it seems like there would be some real pressure for you to go out and do this and earn this on your own. If, if I'm asking the question the right way, if you follow where I'm going with this. Yeah. You, I, did you, <laughs> have you been listening to what I've, I've been saying to tons of other people? I, what you said about the golf ball doesn't care who you are. And that's, that's one of the main reasons I love golf. Um, it's, it's a very clear cut profession. If you look at Q school this week, there's a number you have to get to and, there's no subjectivity in that. You just have to play well enough to get there. And the golf ball does not know who you are, and it reacts the same for everybody, and we're all playing the same course. And um, that's what I love about golf. 
Um, and regarding having a fallback option, um, I worked really hard to get my degree at Stanford and obviously that comes with a lot of opportunities, but I realized that, you know, one of my best friends and kind of mentors and it's like an older brother to me, Joe Bramlett, um, he, probably the best way to answer this is to tell his story where he was all American at Stanford, dealt with some injuries, was the first African American guy to get his PJ tour card right out of school since Tiger. And, um, he, he played pretty well, but then had some back injuries, basically couldn't swing a golf club for two years. And I would see him out at the Stanford practice facility, hitting a couple wedge shots and then going back into the hitting bay to roll out and stretch and, obviously in some pretty bad discomfort. And I, you know, I admire the fact that he stuck with it. He's probably one of the most tenacious competitive individuals I've ever seen. And he finally was able to play and didn't really know how this year was going to go. Had uh, four events to earn 17 grand on the web and finished fifth in Mexico. Um, he was the group behind me in Mexico. I got to watch him shoot 64. I think the final day to fulfill his medical and then had an incredible year. He finished number one on the web in scoring average and number 20 in combined finals and regular season money, but didn't get his card. Um, so he'll be back on the web next year. But you know, that, that story of a guy who sticks with it through what 99% of people would never be able to get through. He just says that plan B distraction plan A. And so, it's a really long way of saying that I am a hundred percent focused on what I'm doing right now. And, um, you know, my dad says the best funded startups usually fail. Um, you know, it's ones that have a, a short cash runway that have a fire lit under them and, uh, often have to do perform the best to survive. So it's a little bit of that mindset that I'm trying to adopt and, um, and do everything I can to, to play great. When you turned pro, you'd, uh, moved to Las Vegas curious how did you come to that decision what's the best part about living out there and do you miss california a little bit or is your uh, your new hometown just fantastic for for travel and then practice facilities stuff like that for you get your game to the next level where you want it at the best part about vegas i i actually i really love it here honestly um i grew up and lived within 10 minutes of stanford my entire life but um you know golfers tend to end up in florida arizona Texas and now um, Vegas is becoming a huge spot for a lot of younger players and a lot of great players. And um, obviously, as a KPMG athlete, I have to say that uh, it's a great tax rate. It's a very favorable place to live for taxes. <laughs> um, uh, but there's I have two fantastic practice facilities in TPC Las Vegas and TPC Summerlin. I'm at a new golf course called the Summit, uh, which is amazing. And the best part about it too is I realized that people to play with and having a good group of, of friends and, and games and people to practice with is so important and makes every day so much more fun and exciting and even playing for 10, 20, 30 dollars or whatever makes it around so much more productive uh, than just going out and playing with yourself and you know there's an incredible group of, of players here and people that motivate me to get better and I love walking out to summer and seeing eight to 10 guys grinding on the range. And that's uh, kind of what you said about, um, you know, trying to, to keep going is I know there's people trying to take my job and people trying to beat me and people trying to get better and I'm not going to let them do it. Well, I've just got a couple more here for you. They're kind of quick hitters and we'll get you out of here. Um, sure. So the first thought that comes to mind here, you got to play in two Walker cups. What's the coolest part about playing in a Walker cup for the American side? Walker Cups were incredible. I love, I mentioned, I love playing for a team and uh, you know, playing for the Junior Sharks was really cool, but playing for your country is even cooler. And I think everyone that's that's been fortunate enough to do that would agree. That was awesome. I, I have such great memories and, and friendships and uh, it was just an incredible experience. But putting on the USA uniform and, and walking out there and hearing your name announced from the United States of America is, is pretty cool. There's so many people that represent our country so well and, and do so many great things for our country. It's, I feel so fortunate to have been able to do that while doing something I absolutely love, which is golf. I'm assuming you've, 
you've played both of these courses, so I'll ask the question. But if you had to pick one every day, Pebble Beach or Cypress Point? I have such a soft spot for, for Pebble, but that's that's so tough. I would say I would one of my top golf bucket list items is to play Cypress Point with a wooden driver and a ballata ball. That's I would trade that over any round at Pebble Beach, but if I were to play one golf course for the rest of my life, you can't say no to Pebble Beach. That place is amazing. Last one I have here for you. If you could take, uh, say, three other guys off the web that you've got to be good friends with, that you guys are going to hang out in Vegas, play a competitive match, go out and have some fun afterwards, what's, what other three guys would you take and what do you admire about those guys the most? Well, I'd, I'd say my best friend out there is Joe Bramlett. Um, I, I've kind of I've talked about him already, and um, you know we we have our five dollar birdie game every practice round, which gets very intense, and uh, we do not feel bad about taking each other's money and getting in each other's wallets, which is awesome. But uh, we both want nothing but the best for each other. Um, but there's so many I, I can't narrow it down to three. There's so many great guys that I played with in college that are out there and it's fun to see them having success at the next level. But again, that's motivating for me to, uh, to catch them. You know, you see guys like Sam Burns and Wyndham Clark and Aaron Wise and Bryson DeChambeau and John Rahm and the list goes on and on guys that are having a ton of success and I just want them to know I'm coming for them soon. Well, thanks so much for taking the time today. We'll look forward to watching you next year on the web.com tour and uh, best of luck for next season. Sounds great. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.